In December of the following year, a man strangles a woman in her city apartment. A young girl vanishes from her home during the night, apparently abducted by a stranger. A homeowner is startled by an intruder who, in the ensuing scuffle, strikes a fatal blow. A woman loses control of her ferocious dogs and they maul the neighbor to death. Stories like these are in the news every day. And each of them raises serious questions about justice. Does a murderer deserve the death penalty? What is the proper sentence for a kidnapper? How much responsibility does someone have for an accidental death or an unintended injury? When does negligence become criminal? It's hard to find agreement on these questions. We can just listen to the talk shows where everyone has a different opinion. And although we all want justice, we don't always agree what justice requires. Not even our legal system has all the answers. A jury reaches a verdict and the judge throws it out on a technicality. A judge makes a decision only to have it overturned on appeal. In the end, we're left wondering whether justice has really been served. The Bible can help. It doesn't give us a complete code of regulations for every situation that may arise in every culture. However, it does provide a set of cases to help us understand the basic principles of divine justice. These legal cases are contained in the Book of the Covenant that God gave to Moses. And each case consists of both a crime and a punishment. And the punishments God gave to Israel as a nation under his direct divine rule do not always apply today. Yet they still help us understand how to seek justice in an unjust world, looking to see that justice is served. So the Israelites are camped out at Mount Sinai, and Moses is on the mountain of God. He's receiving the laws of the covenant. And God gave these laws to his people so they would know how to act and treat each other in the covenant community, especially after they got to the promised land. <coughs> the Lord wanted to regulate human behavior by protecting the innocent and punishing the guilty. He also wanted the punishment to fit the crime. He defines and sets the standard for what is justice and demands that his people and his laws are just as well. Fairness, justice, reconciliation, and peace were all important and still are important to God. But they were important as he was birthing the nation of Israel, wanting them to be different from the pagan nations around them. So last week the Lord introduced this book of the covenant by regulating how his people were to treat their male and female servants. And they would be treated fairly with dignity as human beings made in his image. But this morning we're going to be introduced to case law involving death, assault, and livestock. And these laws are specific but not comprehensive. And they were a guide to judges in making proper rulings and handing down punishments. In some cases they could determine what the punishment was, but in others the punishments were non-negotiable. And these laws show God's desire for his people to be fair and just and to take, their, take responsibility for their actions so that in the end peace and harmony could be achieved within the covenant community. Instead of engineering political, social, and economic changes in our society, God desires to engineer an inner heart change in his people. And when he does that, the results will change our society. So our society as a whole will never be fair, justice, and responsible unless each one of us is inwardly changed by God. God can change the world if we allow him to change our hearts, each one of us according to his purposes. And that brings us to our big idea this morning. That God desires to change the world by changing his people's hearts. Before we dive in, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, we ask you to open our hearts and minds and fill us with your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we pray that your word would come alive for us, and that all the words spoken would be honored and glorified to you. Draw us closer to yourself by the power of your word. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So the first point this morning is cases involving death. And we're in Exodus 21, verses 12 to 17. This is what God's word says. Anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, 
They had to flee to a place I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. Anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. So this section begins by fleshing out the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And it's dealing with intentional and unintentional killing. These laws involving death show how important the sanctity of life was to the Lord. And the general principle is if someone intentionally strikes and kills another person, they are to be put to death. This is called premeditated murder, which is a deliberate scheme to take another's life. And it's pretty clear cut that in this case, the punishment is the death penalty. But then we see our first mitigating circumstance. If a person did not intentionally kill the other person, and God let it happen, he did have some recourse. This reminds us that God is sovereign, and nothing happens in this world without him knowing it and being in control of it. So if the killing was unintentional, the offender was to flee to a place that God designated. Now the places or places that the offender could flee was the altar or city of refuge. And they, they were literally fleeing to where they thought the presence of God was. They're throwing themselves on his mercy. This could be the altars that were set up in the wilderness, or the altars that will be set up in the tabernacle once that's built. And later, once they were in the promised land, God would set up six cities of refuge where the offender could go. So if it was an accidental death of some kind, they could go to the altar, or a city of refuge, where they would have asylum until the judges or court could hear their case. And the reason this was needed was because of the blood feuds that went on in the time. A member of a tribe or family had the responsibility to punish anybody who wronged a member of their family or tribe, especially in cases of murder. So if the trial the offender was found guilty of premeditated murder, they would be taken right from God's altar and be put to death. There was no place they could hide. They couldn't even hide at God's altar. There was no place they could go where God's punishment wouldn't find them. Next we see the fleshing out of the fifth commandment, to honor your father and mother. After the sanctity of life came the sanctity of the family and importance. The family was the backbone of the community, so anything that destroyed the fabric of the community was condemned by God. If anyone attacked their father or mother, they were sentenced to death. This included murder and even attempted murder. This showed a contempt and disrespect for those whom God had put in authority over them. This was not honoring of their parents, and their punishment would be death. It's important to see here that fathers and mothers were considered equals. The next scenario is someone who kidnaps another person for the purpose of selling them into slavery. Slavery, as we know, was outlawed by God with this law. If you were caught dealing in slavery at any level, as a middleman or a slave owner, you were put to death. And in, uh, in other cultures, it would have only been a capital crime if the nobility was kidnapped. But to God, all human beings were made in his image. And as such, were, were sacred. God decided that his people would be different from the different cultures around them. Next, we we'll revisit the fifth commandment again of honoring your father and mother. If anyone was found guilty of cursing their father and mother, they would be put to death. This would have been more than just a one-time thing. This would have been like acting in total disrespect for their parents for a long time. The word for honor means head or weight. To honor one's parents means to give due weight to their position of authority. And to curse them is to make light of them. It's to disparage them, insult them, treat them with contempt, and refusing to accept their authority. A child who was guilty of attacking or killing their parents physically, or even attacking them with their words would be put to death. And that brings us to our second point this morning. Cases involving assault. And that's found in Exodus 21, verses 18 to 27. Again, this is what God's word says. If people quarrel and one person hits another with a stone, or with their fist, 
and the victim does not die but is confined to bed, the one who struck the blow will not be held liable if the other can get up and walk around outside of the staff. However, the guilty party must pay the injured person for any loss of time and see that the victim is completely healed. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. If people are fighting to hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely but there is no serious injury, the offender must, fall, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands, and the court allows. But if there is a serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. Another who hits a male or female slave in the eye and destroys it must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. And another who knocks out the tooth of a male or female slave must let the slave go free to compensate for the tooth. So this section on assaults shows four different cases. The first case is a quarrel between two people. And they start with words, but it deteriorates into a physical fight. And the fact that a stone or fist was used shows that it's not premeditated, because there was no deliberate scheme beforehand. If one of the persons had died, the other would have had to go and plead his case at the altar of the city of refuge. But in this case, one of them is hurt only enough to be confined to bed. That means he's lost time at work, he's incurred medical bills. Because both parties were in the wrong, the one who struck the blow is not held responsible as long as the other one does not die or is not permanently injured. But the one who caused the injury must pay for the other's lost work time and medical bills until they're completely healed. This again was more than what other cultures would award. In those other cultures, the offender would only have to pay the loss of earnings and not medical expenses. A second case is about the master who beats a man or female slave with a rod and they die as a result. So now this would include Hebrew servants and not Hebrew slaves. That's what we discussed masters and servants a little bit. Hebrews would sell themselves as servants because of poverty, being in debt, or having to pay restitution. In return, they would receive room, board, and arrange from the master. And also, non Hebrew slaves were acquired by purchase or capture in war. So the master had a right to discipline the servants and slaves who were working for him. And the use of a rod was considered non lethal punishment. But the master had to be careful how severe his discipline was, because even the life of a servant or slave was sacred to God. The punishment would have to, would have to fit the crime. Meaning if the servant or slave died and there was intent or malice on the part of the master, they could receive the death penalty. But the servant or slave did not die, the master would not be punished, but given the benefit of the doubt that he was just disciplining his servant. He began to give the benefit of the doubt that there was no intent to harm. Since the master had paid for the servant's services, they were considered his property. Or more, a more accurate translation of the Hebrew is, they were his money. So again, he had the right to discipline, but because the master relied on his servant or slave, he'd be a fool to cause them to not be able to work. The loss of work time and medical cost incurred would be the punishment led against the master. For Hebrew and non-Hebrew servants and slaves, this law was a major upgrade from other cultures. The third case is about a fight that causes injury to a third party or innocent bystander. Using the scenario of the first case, a fight breaks out amongst two parties, and an innocent bystander is hurt. In this case, the innocent bystander is pregnant. She's a pregnant woman, and due to getting hit, she gives birth prematurely. But neither mother nor child are seriously injured. The punishment would be a fine based on the demands of the husband and the injured woman, based on the demands of the husband and the injured woman, and what the court would allow. In Hittite and Assyrian cultures, the fines would have been based on social standing, but not so in the Israelite community, where all people were seen as equals in the eyes of God and the law. So now what if the 
third part of our innocent bystander died or was seriously injured. So in the event of accidental death, the offender could go to the altar or the city of refuge. And they could wait for the judge's decision there. But in the event of serious injury, the judge could, judge could allow restitution, which is what's meant by you to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, etc. This is called the lex talionis, or the law of retribution. But this doesn't mean that if I cause your eye to be taken out, that my eye will be taken out. So it should be more accurately called the law of equivalence, meaning that the punishment was to fit the crime. In pagan cultures, the punishment did not always fit the crime, especially if you were a person of status and had money. Not that Israelite laws were unfair as they allowed fines in cases involving a higher status person permanently injuring a lower status person. Stewart says this, expressions like an eye for an eye were understood to mean a penalty that hurts the person who ruins someone else's eye as much as he would be hurt if his own eye was actually ruined also. The precise penalty was left up to the judges by Italian law. It might involve anything from banishment to loss of property and property rights, to punitive confinement, to special financial penalties, to corporal punishment, to public humiliation, or to any combination of these. Again, these laws and standards were more fair, were fair and more, than, and more just than what the pagan nations around them called for. By implementing these standards, God was first inwardly changing his people's hearts to be fair and just in order to change the world. The fourth case begins the humane treatment and provision for maid servants and manservants. And again, it carefully limited and regulated the master's discipline of his servants. Two extremes, eye and tooth, are used to show that the master needed to have the best welfare of his servants in mind at all times. If the servant, because of the master's discipline, lost anything as serious as an eye, to anything least serious as a tooth, the slave must be freed. So think about this. A servant is free to take their services elsewhere to a better master. But if this master gets to be known as too strict of a disciplinarian, causing injuries to his servants, he could also lose the services of others who might be looking for work. So in both of these ways, the master is punished by losing whatever monetary benefits he would receive from having servants. The fact that in Israel, servants and slaves had legal and human rights was unheard of in the cultures around them. <clears throat> that brings us to our third point called Cases Involving Livestock. Found in Exodus 21, verses 28 to 26. Again, this is what God's word says. If a bull gores a man or woman to death, the bull will be stoned to death, and its meat must not be eaten. But the owner of the bull will not be held responsible. If, however, the bull has had a habit of goring, and the owner has been warned, but has not kept it kept up and it kills a man or a woman, the bull is to be stoned, and the owner also shall be put to death. However, the payment is demanded the owner may redeem his life or the payment of whatever is demanded. This law also applies if a bull gores a son or daughter. If a bull gores a male or female slave, the owner must pay 30 shekels of silver to the master of the slave, and the bull is to be stoned to death. If anyone uncovers a pit or digs one and fails to cover it, and an ox or donkey falls into it, the one who opened the pit must pay the owner for the loss and take the dead animal in exchange. If anyone's bull enters someone else's bull and it dies, the two parties are to sell the live one and divide both the money and the dead animal equally. However, if it is known that the bull has had the habit of goring, yet the owner did not keep it pinned up, the owner must pay animal for animal and take the dead animal in exchange. So in that society, everyone was a farmer, everyone used bulls, oxen, and donkeys to plow their fields and to carry goods, etc. These animals were expensive and dangerous, and each person had an obligation to not let their beasts get out of hand. So 
In the first case, it's about a bull who bores a man or woman to death. The stipulation is there have been no prior instances of going by the bull. Again, it doesn't matter if it killed a male or female slave. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter if it killed a male or female. Punishment for the bull and the owner was the same no matter what sex was killed. The punishment for the bull was it was stoned to death. Death by stoning was a form of capital punishment for human beings. And so this showed that God was holding the bull responsible for its actions. In Genesis 9, 5, we see these words. And for your life blood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from every human being as well. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. God demanded that people and animals be held responsible for their actions. In the surrounding nations, people were held responsible, but not animals. God wanted his people and animals to treat others better than the nations around them. God's creatures are always held to a higher standard. Now, the owner of a first-time offending bull would not be held legally responsible, but there were still built-in consequences. The meat of the bull could not be eaten because it was defiled by its actions. The owner of the bull not only lost the services of the bull, but couldn't even benefit from its meat or skin, etc. And as bulls were expensive, this would have been a hardship on the owner. The next case is about a bull who had a habit of boring people, and the owner knew it and had been warned about it. So if this bull, if this bull kills a man or a woman, it now becomes negligence on the part of the party owner. The owner did not take proper responsibility for his property, and someone was killed. So now the bull must be stoned, and the owner could incur the death penalty because he knew the bull was dangerous and didn't do nothing enough to protect other people. This would fall under unintentional or negligent homicide. And the victim's family of the court could demand payment from the owner. The owner's life could be redeemed by paying whatever was demanded. In this case, he would not have to incur the death penalty. So the next case says that the same law applies to the son or daughter who was born to death. Everyone is granted the same status under the law. Father, mother, son, or daughter. In the surrounding cultures, if someone killed a son or daughter, the victim's family could take revenge and by, by demanding that their son or daughter was killed. The Deuteronomy 24, 16 says this. Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. Again, we see that God's laws are fair and more just and merciful than the nations around them. The next case is about a bull who bore a male or female servant or slave. <clears throat> we know that the servant has been killed because the bull has been stoned to death. It's not mentioned here that the bull's owner would still be held liable as in previous cases. But there's also a third party involved. The master of the servant who was killed must be compensated. And the compensation here is an extra 30 shekels of silver that was mandated by God instead of the courts. This was considered the standard price for a slave with a blood price. And interestingly, this is the same price that Jesus betrayed Jesus for. Jesus paid the price with his blood to save all of us from our slavery to sin. The fact that the bull was put to death emphasizes the value of the slave's life. To the Lord, there was no difference between a free person and a servant or slave. The next case is about negligence involving a person's property that causes harm to an animal. So if someone dug a pit or uncovered a pit and didn't cover it back up, and an ox or donkey fell into it, the owner of the pit is liable. These animals were vital in that society and they were expensive for the owner to replace. Now the animals probably died or had been put down because of its injuries. So the owner of the pit must pay the owner of the dead animal compensation. The owner of the pit would be allowed to take possession of the dead animal, but only for its skin. According to Deuteronomy 14.21, it says this. They were not to eat anything they found that was already dead. 
that says the animal wasn't the offending party, the carcass could be salvaged. Now, it's not mentioned here, but if a person was killed by falling into the pit, the other would be held liable for an accidental or negligent death. And a ruling would be handed down at the deaths of the Gordon Bull previously. The last set of cases mentioned are about animals involved in killing another animal. If two bulls were fighting and one dies, the two owners share the losses equally. The live bull would be sold and the owner would divide the money and the carcass of the dead bull equally. There would be no special liability for the owner whose bull killed the other bull. But again, if there was negligence, if it was known that the bull had a habit of goring and the owner did not keep it pinned up, the offending bull's owner would have to compensate the other owner for the dead bull. And the offending owner could then keep the carcass of the dead bull. Again, this week, you may be wondering how we apply this scripture to our lives today. And I believe there's three ways. First, our Lord is a just God. And because justice is part of his character, he can never be unjust. Psalm 89, 14 says this. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, that Sue read, says this. He is the rock. His works are perfect. And all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. So because the Lord wants to change the world by first changing us, he desires us to be just as he is just. He wants us to cultivate his sense of fairness and justice in our lives and not, his, not our own. That brings us to our first next step. Which is to cultivate God's fairness and justice in my life and not my own. Next, in every case that we study, we see that God wants his people to take responsibility for their actions and to accept the consequences for their actions. We see this whether we intentionally or unintentionally kill someone. We see this if an argument comes to blows or if an innocent bystander gets injured. We see this if our property causes death or injury. And again, because God wants to change the world by first changing us, he desires that his people accept responsibility and the consequences for their actions. And that brings us to our second next step. To accept the responsibility and the consequences for my actions. Lastly, in order to cultivate the Lord's fairness and justice in our lives, and in order to accept responsibility and the consequences for our actions, we must be changed. These attributes are not normally part of our sinful human nature. We must become more like Jesus. We must be more connected to God. And we must allow him to change our hearts from the inside out. The only way our church, community, and the world can be changed is if each one of us individually allows God to change our hearts. And we strive each and every day to live these attributes out. And that brings us to our last next step, which is to allow God to change my heart from the inside out using me to change the world. So as Gina rocks to come to lead us in a final hymn, yeah. the usher's prepared to cut the ties and offer you. Thank you.